now that we have understood how to work the problems, then we're back to the reaction quotient. In the case of solubility, it's really precipitate or no precipitate is the question because when you mix two solutions, if the concentrations are high enough based upon the KSP value, then a precipitate will form. If they're not, then it won't. So we're back to equilibrium. Is it to the product? Is it to the reactant? Or is it at equilibrium? So you're doing the reaction quotient. The reaction quotient, remember, is your Q. It's the ion product of the initial concentration and it's the same form as the solubility product constant. But in solubility, okay, there's a slight variation. If Q is less than KSP, there's no precipitate. It's an unsaturated solution. If Q is either equal to KSP or greater than, then you have a precipitate form. So on the previous, you had a shift to the reactant, shift to the product, or no change because it was at equilibrium. Well, in this case, because you're adding in equilibrium with the solid, if it's equal to, you have to have precipitate, and if it's greater than, you have to have precipitate. Now remember, Q is um, comparable to K, and so the value is products over reactants. Now in this particular case, we have to have the reactants present as the solid, so it drops to one. So what we're really looking at is do we have more products than we're supposed to have? Okay, now on to the important part, the math. Um, Qs are, are for solubility product are strictly equilibrium uh, problems. Because they're an equilibrium problem in terms of are they at equilibrium or not, there are no ICE tables, okay? You're going to use the values given. Now, you might have to uh, dilute them, and we'll see that in a minute, but we're not going to. You're going to probably have to use the root fa uh, function or 1 over y in your calculator because oftentimes we're greater than squared. The advantage is you can eliminate something in X because it's a common ion. You must check if you eliminate, and you must use the original value given. Now, this one is the kicker because in these types of problems, everybody wants to go make up an ICE table and they want to double a concentration given or divide it by two or whatever. Don't do that. Okay, and again, back to been there, done that when I was in your seat, nobody flat out said, with Q, no ice. Okay, Q, no ice. Okay, so twice. All right, so let's work a problem here. A chemistry student mixes 20 milliliters of silver nitrate with sodium uh, cyanide volume will precipitate form. Okay, so what we're really looking for is the silver cyanide. And this is the equilibrium we're looking at because this is the solid. Okay, now first things first, we have to have a KSP value. And we could look it up and our KSP value is, where is our KSP value on here? So, silver nitrate, oh, silver cyanide, here it is. Sorry, guys, you know that I've got things mixed up. Okay, so we have a KSP equal to 1.2 times to the minus 16th. And you're like, wow, yep, KSP is real interesting because if you take the time to look at that table, you may see some that are minus 18, minus 34, minus 20 something. These are the ones that really don't want to form a solid. Okay, so this is the equilibrium we're looking at. So we simply, again, no ice because it's Q, so no ice. But what we need is the concentration. So Q is going to be equal to the silver concentration 
times the cyanide concentration. Rather simple, right? Okay, so wait a minute. For the silver concentration, we're going to start with 20 milliliters of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 5th molar divided by, we're adding it to so the final volume is 30 milliliters. So we're going to end up with a concentration of the silver of 3.0 times 10 to the minus 5th molar. Now, these are dilutions because you're mixing two solutions. Now, with cal solubility product, that is really very common because you're mixing two solutions together, so you have to recalculate the concentration. So the cyanide is 10 milliliters times 7.5 times 10 to the minus 4th molar divided by 30 milliliters again. So you get a whopping 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4th. Well, so what we're going to do is go in and we're going to set these in here. 3.0 times 10 to the minus 5th times 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4th is equal to Q. And again, they're 1 to 1, so there's no exponent. So Q comes out equal to 7.5 times 10 to the minus 9th. So if we compare Q to K... And Q is 7.5 times 10 to the minus 9th. And K is, well, KSP is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 16th. So Q is much, much greater than KSP. So that means lots of product. So we're going to shift this way. So yes precipitate will form. Now, remember, precipitate stands for precipitate. We call it PPT or solid. Okay? So, this is actually, these to me are real simple and uh, fun. Okay, yeah, I know, I'm warped. But they're simple to do once you get the concentration set up. And that's really the only tricky part with these is your concentration gets a little walk. Okay, so on this one, a chemist is going to mix 225 milliliters of point with 138 milliliters. Okay, fine. So we're mixing the barium nitrate with the potassium hydroxide. So the equation we're looking for is barium hydroxide dissociating to barium, 2 plus, plus 2 hydroxide. Ooh, this one's going to be interesting. So your Q is going to be equal to the barium concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration squared. Okay? Now, the other thing we're going to need is the KSP for barium hydroxide, which is 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3. So that one's actually a rather large one. So wait a minute. We need the barium concentration. And we've got to dilute it because it's 225 milliliters times 0.05 molar divided by, okay, when you add these two volumes together, it's going to be 363 milliliters. Okay, remember... Um, let me do it over here, 225 plus 138 milliliters is equal to 363 milliliters. Okay, so that gives me a whopping 0 0.03099 molar. And then we will do the same thing for the hydroxide, which is equal to 138 milliliters times 0 0.020 molar divided by 363 again. The beauty of these is once you get the final volume, you've got it. And that's equal to 0 0.00760 molar. Now, here's the ugly part. All we have to do is plug those values in. So we're going to get 0 0.03099 
times 0 0.00760 squared. Now, here's the kicker. People are like, wait, but it was double the concentration, so we have to double that. No, 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 you use the value that you are given. You don't get to make up numbers. This is in an ICE table. So my Q value is going to come out to be 1.7898 times 10 to the minus 6. So if we look at Q to K, so this is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6. And this is 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3. K, Q is much less than K, so no precipitate. Okay, so that was relatively easy. So when we have something that's relatively simple, as y'all like to say, we have to complicate it. So here we go. Now, part B says what concentration of KOH is needed to cause the precipitation. So wait a minute, we didn't get a precipitate form, so we needed to precipitate. Well, precipitation occurs when your KSP is equal to Q, right? That We said that on the previous slide. So all we have to do is set up the KSP equal to the barium concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration squared. So we know our KSP, that's 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3. We are told that we're using the same concentration of barium, so it's 0 0.03099, and we want the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay, now here's the fun part. Okay, the algebra word. All right, here we go. So your hydroxide ion concentration comes out, the squared comes out equal to um, okay, precipitation forming, so same concentration of a barium, oh, okay, Back up just a second, guys, sorry. Um, if we're using the exact same concentration of the barium we started with, then we would use 0 0.050 molar. Now, if you're confused on the test, just use the value that, that um, I'll try to make it clearer because otherwise we'll get two different answers. And since I can't see all your work easily, more about that later, we'll get to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to get say that the um, hydroxide ion concentration squared is 0 0.1. We're going to take the square root of both sides. So we're going to end up with x is equal to 0 0.3162 molar of hydroxide. Now, here's a side note, and we'll see this problem again later when we talk about multiple equilibria, but we're actually doing it now. We're just going to throw it in. What happens if we know this and I asked, what pH is this? Well, it's actually simple. If you take the negative log of 0 0.3162, that means my pOH is equal to 0.5, which means my pH is equal to 13.5. So in this particular problem, we're just solving for the hydroxide ion concentration, and lo and behold, that gives us a pH unit. In case that that wasn't confusing enough, and it really isn't, but you've got to take these apart, we're going to do it again, but we're going to look at it slightly different. So on C, what concentration of KOH is needed to cause precipitation of the same concentration a silver nitrate. So we know our silver concentration is going to be equal to, um, in this case, I used 0 0.03099 molar. Okay. And what we need to know is the concentration of hydroxide. Now, this equilibrium is silver hydroxide, silver plus 
plus OH minus. And the KSP for this one is 2.0 times 10 to the minus 8. And remember, if precipitation is occurring, Q has to be equal to KSP if there is precipitate. So we get KSP is equal to the silver concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration. We're given our KSP 2.0 times 10 to the minus 8th is equal to 0 0.03099 molar X, which is our hydroxide ion concentration. So X, or our hydroxide ion concentration, comes out equal to 6.4537 times 10 to the minus 7th. If that's the hydroxide ion concentration, we can find our pOH is equal to 6.19 and our pH is equal to 7.81. So in this particular case, we're just looking for our hydroxide ion concentration, but we're looking at it in terms of the pH. Now, could we do this with like fluoride? Yeah, but it's a little harder because you would have to also do the KB, the salt in there. And if we had a lot more time, yeah, we'd do that, but we're not going to. But you are going to be asked probably, and in the last segment I do a straight one where I'm straight out asking for the the pH so you'll see it as we go on but in this particular case this is just a side note we could ask this question now there's one other variation on this and when we have a precipitation of two species and this is actually a common methodology used in um, different techniques and commercial techniques is that you've got two salts are the most common, excuse me, two metals, and you need to get one out and leave the other. Um, you may want to get rid of one. You may want to keep both of them, different compounds, etc. And sometimes they have similar concentrations. Sometimes they don't. It really doesn't matter. What you do, the trick is, is to find... Um, something that will precipitate both of them, but at different amounts. So what we're looking at here on this problem is that we're looking for uh, what happens when we get the compounds, okay? So the first one is, and we'll just do them in order, is zinc uh, oxalate. That's your solid, and it's going to dissociate into zinc. 2 plus plus the C2O4 2 minus oxalate ion. The second one is iron oxalate. In both these cases, the charges are the same. We'll work one where they're not in a minute, but right now we'll go with these being the same. Okay, so the easiest way to think about it is, is we know our concentrations are our metals. These are known. So what we're really looking for is the concentration here. And the question is, is which one is going to precipitate first? So what we have to do is basically what we're looking for is find the one that precipitates with the smallest added, in this case, oxalate ion. So, if we know they're going to precipitate, that means that KSP, or in this case, let me go the other way, Q is equal to KSP, which in this case is zinc 2 plus times oxalate. And the same thing is true over here. So the KSP, which is equal to Q, 
is equal to the iron concentration times the oxalate iron concentration. Now, if we look these up, we're going to find that the KSP of zinc uh, uh, oxalate is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 8. We know our zinc concentration, and we're looking for our oxalate concentration. Same thing over here, except we have a different KSP. 3.2 times 10 to the minus 7 is equal to 0 0.080 times the oxalate C2O4 2 minus. So we find here that the oxalate concentration is 4.0 times 10 to the minus 6. This one, the oxalate concentration comes out equal to 3.375 times 10 to the minus 7th. Okay? So, this value is smaller. Therefore, the zinc oxalate will precipitate first. It's as simple as that. Okay, so you're comparing apples to apples. Okay, now, what is the concentration of the first cation solution is in solution when the second begins precipitation? Huh? Okay, when you read this, it's easier to just go ahead and replace things. So what is the concentration of the first cation? Well, the first cation is your zinc ion. When the second, which is the iron C2O4 begins precipitation. So if we're looking for the zinc, then this is still KSP is equal to zinc 2 plus times C2O4 2 minus. Okay, that's still given. Your KSP didn't change. This is your one you're looking for, so you have to get this value. So that means that this value comes from when iron precipitated. So if we look up here, this value here will come down into here. So it's 4.0 times 10 to the minus 6. Because at that point in time, a lot of the zinc is already precipitated. So you want the zinc concentration left in the solution when the iron starts precipitating. So we again do the algebra and it's simple math. It's just large and small numbers. Um, so what we end up with is the zinc is 0 0.00675 molar. So if you notice, we started off at 08, and now we're down to 0.006 before the iron even starts precipitating. Okay? So let's do this again, except we're now going to do it in three parts. Okay? So again, what we need are the KSPs and... Precipitation begins when Q is equal to KSP. So we have three things. We have lead nitrate and we're added to three anions. So this is your common. So the first one is going to be lead chloride. Your second one is going to be lead chromate, and your third one is going to be lead hydroxide. Now, notice in this case, we have coefficients, or excuse me, subscripts, which will come up to be coefficients. So in this case, your KSP is going to be equal to your lead ion times your fluoride ion squared. This one is your lead times your chromate 
And this one is your lead times your hydroxide squared. So in this particular case, you just can't look at it and see. And we're told that the concentration of each, these are the anions. And so we're just adding the lead to the solution. So in this particular case, we're going to plug in what we know. This is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 8. We've got our lead is what we're looking for because it's being added in. Our fluoride is 0 0.075 squared. So our lead concentration comes out equal to 4.8 times 10 to the minus 6th when precipitation occurs. Now, remember, I squared the 0 0.075 and then divided the 2.7 times 10 to the minus 8 by that to get the value. So on this one, our KSP value is 2.8 times 10 to the minus 13th is equal to, again, your lead is what you're looking for, and your chromate is given 0 0.075 molar. Okay, so your lead concentration here comes out equal to 3.733 repeating times 10 to the minus 12th. Now your third one is 1 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15th is equal to your lead concentration times the 0 0.075 molar squared. So our lead concentration here comes out equal to 2.133 repeating times 10 to the minus 13th. So precipitation is going to occur when you have the smallest amount of lead present. So if we look this one's going to be the first because it's the smallest, and this one's the second, and this one is the third. All we did was we solved for the amount of lead needed to precipitate. And so we get this value. Now, on B, what is the concentration of the first anion species? Okay, the first anion species is the first one precipitating. So the first one to precipitate would be the hydroxide ion concentration when the second compound, second compound, is Pb chromate, okay, begins precipitating. So in this case, we know that we're looking for the hydroxide ion concentration of the first one when the second one starts precipitating. If we're looking for the hydroxide, the only one that's got it in there is the KSP is equal to the lead times the hydroxide ion squared. We know we have 1.2 times 10. Okay, that was 15. If your math didn't work out, that's why. Times 10 to the minus 15th is equal to... We want the concentration of the hydroxide, so we know what the lead is. We get the lead from the second one, so it's 3.733 times 10 to the minus 12th times the hydroxide concentration squared. So my hydroxide ion concentration squared is equal to 3.21457 times 10 to the minus 4th. You're going to take the square root of both sides, so your hydroxide ion concentration comes out equal to 0 0.017929 molar, which is the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay, so we're done with that one because that's what they asked for. And because that's kind of a mess, I will clean it up to 9 molar. So we'll rewrite that as 0 0.01793 molar hydroxide. All right, so we're going to look at this. Okay, now the third one 
and out of sheer meanness, I'm going to change color so you see it. What's the concentration of the first anion species, that's still the hydroxide, when the third compound, and what's our third compound? Lead fluoride starts precipitating. Well, if we're looking for the hydroxide, we're still back to the same equation here. So we have the KSP is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15th. Now our lead concentration comes from here, the third one. So that's 4.8 times 10 to the minus 6 times hydroxide concentration squared. Hydroxide ion concentration squared is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the minus 10th. So the hydroxide ion concentration is equal to 1.581 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. Now, out of entertainment value, and I did not do this before, let's go back and I'm going to change colors so that we look very different. Okay, and I'm going to look at these. Since we did the hydroxide in each case, what I want to do is I want to take 1.581e to the minus 5. Okay, so our pOH will be equal to 4.80 which means our pH here for this third one is 9.20, okay? So for this one, we're going to do it again, log of 0.01793, okay? That gives us a pOH equal to 1.75. So our pH is equal to 12 0.25 and up at the top we had well we were given the 0 0.075 so my pOH up here is 1.12 so my pH is equal to 12.86 or excuse me, 8-8, eight, eight. can't read my own writing. Okay, so what's happening is, is as the um, lead precipitates out, then your pH decreases, becomes more acidic as your um, lead hydroxide precipitates. So the net effect is, is that you, low, you can lower the pH of the solution by removing the hydroxide. In this case, most of the time we've added acid, but in this case you can add a metal that will precipitate it out and bring it down. So in the first case, um, a couple problems ago, we determined what the pH of the solution was. But in this particular case, um, we're watching what the pH of the solution does. And again, there's going to be, I think it's in the last section, just because where it fell, make sure you go look at that because that's one where we strictly add the multiple equilibria and we look directly at the pH as precipitation occurs or does not occur, etc. Okay, so this brings this one to an end. And remember, there should be several of these up and posted. I will double check that. Um, I'm going to get these up hopefully by the end of the week so you have a little bit over the weekend. I know you're going to be studying the first part but for the test on Monday but this will give you an opportunity to look through. It's still in equilibrium and you can continue on with these And but I'll make sure they're more posted. Okay.